inviting me to all of you for giving your precious time to be here. Time is precious. Every moment is an opportunity to either grow and invest in our own eternal nature or to lose the chance. There's a beautiful verse in the Bhagavad Purana. I were a Bharati Bhai The essence of this verse is that with every rising and setting of the sun, we are one day closer to death. But though, for those who utilize their precious moments in life, to cultivate the seed of devotion. And with every rising in the setting of the sun, we are one day closer to eternal life. In the world we live, beautiful experiences, obstacles, difficulties, tragedies, they come of their own accord. It is explained in the scriptures how the whole creation is constituted on the principle of dualities. Pleasure, pain. Happiness, distress. Honor, dishonor. Success, failure. Victory, defeat. And the nature of the world is we're always grabbing for the positive side and clinging to it when we have it. But the negative side is inevitable. You can't really have one without the other. So how to find real peace, real happiness, in a world where everything is changing. Could I tell you a story? I was hoping you would say that. <laughs> One day, I was sitting on the sandy bank of the river Ganges. It was about noontime. The sun was very bright. I looked up into a clear blue, cloudless sky. And there, way up above, was a hawk. with his wings expanded, soaring in circles. How beautiful. So effortlessly. Just knew exactly how to maneuver his wings. To, he wasn't even flapping his wings. He was just barely moving them. Aviation, um, direction, just by knowing how to harmonize himself with the wind. Sometimes it was flying very fast, sometimes very slow, and I didn't see him moving his wings. And he didn't even go to aviation school. Isn't it incredible? how different living beings are empowered with supernatural powers. Now for the hawk, it doesn't seem like a supernatural power. It seems normal. 
But if a human could do that, yes? It's like if Tukaran just all of a sudden started flying over us. We would think, is he's a master yogi? He has supernatural powers. He must be God. Well, when a bird does it, we just, you know, just hope they don't drop something in there. <laughs> This little boy, if he started crawling up the walls, we would think, oh, he's, he's really a yogi. He's walking up walls. But we see insects doing it all the time and we don't think anything of it. What to speak of fish? They're swimming underwater. Some of them never come to the surface. Well, every living being within creation is empowered with certain supernatural abilities. Well, this hawk was just floating in the wind so gracefully. And I was thinking like that. How amazing that just by the wisdom and power of nature, different species have such knowledge and such abilities and they never have to learn it. It is inherent within them. In thousands and thousands of years, there's never been a bird that didn't know how to fly. And none of them ever went to school and their parents don't even teach them. They just know. The heart was circling lower and lower, lower. Soon he was only a few yards above my head. And I looked up at him. His brownish red wings were, were shining in the sun. His eyes were yellow. They were glistening, totally focused, looking down into the current of the Ganges. So intensely focused. They weren't wavering. He was looking for something. About half of his body, instantly there was some sort of a frantic skirmish. There was waves and splashing, and I could see the hot body was trembling. A few moments later, he emerged from the water with a fish pierced by his claws. The fish was about one foot long, kind of bluish, silver blue. That fish was frantically flapping, flapping, flapping. And I was looking at the fish and he looked totally disoriented and bewildered. his captivity. The hawk looked so majestic and victorious. And with the fish, the hawk flew higher and higher and higher and then flew away from the Ganges and into the forest. It was out of my sight. I began to reflect what message is being shown to me through this apparently ordinary event of this world? It is amazing. Any situation can teach us lessons that liberate us if our hearts are open to receive. In the Bible, Jesus says, Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and 
the door will open. So if we're really receptive, if we're really looking for enlightenment, we can find it even in the most ordinary situations that come upon our day. Because actually, nothing is ordinary. It's only because we take things so for granted and sometimes we become dull to the beauty of the present moment. Things seem ordinary. But just the fact that we're breathing and our heart is beating and the sun is rising and we're able to walk and talk, these are all pretty amazing things. I remember once sitting under a banyan tree, looking up at the tree, and right next to me was a little seed and I was thinking that from this little tiny seed, an entire big banyan tree like this has come out. Every seed has a banyan tree in it, if it's just given the chance to grow. That's a miracle. Can any human being put a massive banyan tree in a seed? And have that banyan tree able to, to create thousands of other seeds, each one with a little banyan tree in it, a big banyan tree. And I looked up into the sky and saw a cloud. I was thinking how in Bombay where I live, one cloud during the monsoon season can completely flood the entire city. Usually happens once or twice every year during monsoons. Bombay is the wealthiest, most influential, powerful city in, economically in all of India. We're getting nice special effects. <laughs> I saw your eyes were sleeping, but now you're very <laughs> One cloud can make such a flood that no cars could drive. It's like Venice. The streets are knee deep water. The airports are closed. The railways are closed. Every shop, even the government buildings, everything's closed down by the quantity of water in one cloud. And yet, if we want to transport water from one place to another, water's very heavy. Big trucks come in. But that cloud has what millions of trucks can't take. And yet it's so light, it's floating in the sky. Isn't that incredible? We just look at a cloud and just think, oh, it's raining. I, mean, you know, nice. I wish it wouldn't rain. Plants <laughs> want it to rain. We'll be saying, I wish it wouldn't rain. And we just look at our bodies and every other bodies. When a mother and father come together to have a child, it's not that they have a master plan for engineering, that this time the, the emulsification of the semen and the, and the ovum is going to create you know, this seed, and then there's going to be a form, and that this time the heart's going to start forming the eyes and the hands and the legs. The mother doesn't know what's going on, and the father knows less. <laughs> And that's happening. The eyes, the legs, the brain, the heart, the emotions, everything comes, and then a little baby comes out. What a miracle. 
miracle of nature. And every person, every animal, every insect is a product of that miracle. Do we appreciate? Do we rejoice? Isn't it thrilling? But because we take things to be so ordinary, we just see the things and we see people and we see opportunities. And we don't we don't assimilate and grow. So while I was sitting on that riverbank, I was thinking, what am I supposed to learn from watching this hawk take that fish out of the water? The fish was just going about his ordinary life like any other day. Probably swimming upstream, downstream with another school, of, with a whole school of fish. Mother, father, children, friends, looking for food, playing, enjoying the waters of the Ganga. When all of a sudden, at the least expected moment, the yellow-eyed hawk of fate ripped him out of his regular life. It was a tragedy. He was about to die. I was thinking, we read about it. We see it on television. We hear about it. We even know people who went through such difficulties. But do we really take it seriously? And it is a reality of this world. At any moment, the yellow-eyed hawk of faith can rip us out of our routine lifestyles. Whoever we are. I've seen it happen to poor farmers. I've seen it happen to powerful politicians. I've seen it happen to multi-billionaires. I've seen it happen to the greatest scholars. What can we do about it? Then I was reflecting, if that fish was swimming deeper in the Ganges, the hawk cannot reach it. As long as we are living our lives on a superficial level, then we're so affected by whatever happens on a superficial level. But if we go deep into who we are, into our own essence, into our relationship with God, in the depth, of our own hearts, of our own consciousness, we can find a place where we're connected to a current of truth, where we see what's happening on the surface, we deal with what's happening on the surface, but we're not really affected by it. Krishna tells in the Gita, Najayate mriyate bhakadachit, which means we have a body which is always changing and is subject to so many external superficial influences. And we have a mind that's also subjected to changing and subjected to so many external influences. But who am I? The Gita tells us we are the life force, the consciousness, the soul within the body, which is eternal, full of knowledge and full of bliss, which is self-satisfied, Atmaram. The soul's nature is to exist eternally in very deep, 
profound satisfaction in its own self and its relationship with the divine, with God, or with Krishna. Krishna means the all-attractive, the supreme, ultimate reservoir of beauty, charm, and grace. That infinite fulfillment of our own spiritual nature is within all of us. And to the degree we go deep into that experience, the Bhagavad Gita says, Paramitrasvami Vartate, when you're experiencing a very high pleasure, nothing can really affect that. Apuryamana Achala Pratishta. The example is given at the ocean. Just a block away is the biggest ocean in the whole world, the Pacific Ocean. Now in India during the monsoon seasons, sometimes rivers go miles wide and pour water into the ocean. And during the dry season, hardly anything is in that river. But it's not that the ocean overfloods during the monsoons and it doesn't dry up during the dry season. Because although there's all these external influences in the form of rivers coming into it, the ocean is so deep in its own right, it's really not effective. So to the degree we can find the depth of that inner satisfaction within ourselves, we can deal with the various occurrences, situations, what, however they may be in this world, with a clear mind, with a detached spirit. And we can be instruments of compassion in any situation, rather than being frustrated. You see, real happiness, from the yoga or spiritual perspective, is not to the degree we take things from outside into ourselves through proprietorship or through sensual and mental pleasures. It's about accessing what's within us. And actually, that is expressed from us into the world. That is real meaning. That is real satisfaction. That is real love what we are all looking for. The most fundamental need of every living being is pleasure. And the only pleasure that can really give fulfillment is that of love. But for love to really to satisfy the heart, not just the mind, it must be without selfishness unmotivated and uninterrupted. That is what everyone is yearning for. And some of us are looking for it in that, or him or her. But wisdom is to understand it is within our hearts. That love is between the eternal soul and Krishna or God. And when we can connect to that love, then that fulfillment, that inner satisfaction manifests as compassion and it comes out from us into the world toward everything and everyone. That is a truly meaningful, satisfactory life because it is in harmony with our nature. That little fish, the hawk of faith could not affect him if he was just swimming deeper. And similarly, whatever happens in this world, we have to deal with it responsibly with a clear mind and a compassionate heart. 
But whatever happens doesn't have to affect us because we're so full and so rich with what we have and who we are and with the grace of God. I was recently speaking about how in Lord Chaitanya's Lila, Lord Chaitanya was a great avatar of Krishna or God who appeared about 500 years ago. And one day, he and all of his very, very great associates, who were scholars and saints and avatars and incarnations, they were all together. And there was a bathing ceremony. And then one little maid servant who was uneducated came from an extremely poor family. She was way in the background, getting clay pots of water, filling it with the Ganges water, and bringing it, and just putting it in neat little rows for everyone to use. Nobody even knew who was bringing it. Her name was Duki. Duki means the miserable one. Now in India, even today, I have found, in some villages, when a family is really poor, and there's really not much hope for a good life as far as material things, sometimes when the brothers and sisters have died, Parents are struggling and suffering. When a child is born, they name him or her Duki, which means the miserable one. And the idea is that because we name our child like this, fate is going to feel sorry for the child and maybe give her a break. So she was Duki, the miserable one. And she was just doing this little thing, just bringing some water. But she did it with so much devotion and emotion and so much love. She just, nobody noticed her, nobody cared. But she wanted to serve the Lord and she wanted to serve all the others. So Lord Chaitanya, who is the Lord, he, he looked over across the bus whose house it was. Who is this? And Shriva said, it is Duki, a maidservant. And the Lord said, this name does not sit in my heart comfortably. From this day, I give her the name Suki, which means the happy one. And at the same time that he gave her that name, he gave her happiness. what yogis may work from lifetimes to achieve, what scholars may strive for lifetimes to achieve, what people may give vast amounts of charity for lifetimes to achieve, she achieved in a moment. Because she was sincere, she was humble, and she wanted to serve without recognition she wanted to serve with a pure heart and please the Lord and please the others. Ishwara Sarvabhutanam You see the divine presence of God, Bhagavan, sees everything from inside out. And Srila Prabhupada writes that Krishna does not see what we offer. Krishna sees the intention, the motivation in which it is offered.
And Suki, she had no material assets or qualifications, but she had sincerity. And that is all that is really required. We are genuinely sincere. That we have an aspiration to rise above our selfish, arrogant tendencies and are actually seeking real love from within. Srila Prabhupada gave a little nice example that when a drop of water falls from a cloud, its original nature is that it is transparent and pure. But when it comes in contact with the earth, it becomes muddy. When we filter the water, we make it pure again. We just bring it back to its original state. So the spiritual path is meant to filter our consciousness to bring it back to its original natural spiritual state. To remove the selfishness, the greed, the envy, the anger, and to allow the true light of our divine nature to shine within our own life and for the whole world. This chanting of God's names, chanting of these divine mantras, that's how it works. It's a way of filtering our consciousness, bringing it back to its original natural state spiritual state, beyond birth, beyond death. And that is such a great need. Recently I was in Northern California and I was asked to speak at the Apple computer company <laughs> in an auditorium. It was very nice. And over 100 employees came. And the next day I was speaking at the Oracle company. <laughs> and then a few days later, I was a little north and I was asked to speak at the Intel Corporation. <laughs> and interestingly, every one of those corporations, do you know what they asked me to speak on? Dealing with stress. <laughs> we volunteered. This is the topic that they want to hear about. How to deal with stress. So I took that as an indication that they're very stressed out. <laughs> very successful. But not about stress. And we were explaining how, um, actually, some, one of the places I told the hawk story. <laughs> if you go deeper into your life, then yoga is the process of going deeper. Experiencing something higher. Then other things don't, mind, don't disturb us so much. It's just like, if you have a hundred dollars and somebody steals from you ninety-nine dollars and ninety-nine cents, is that disturbing? But if you have one billion dollars and someone steals ninety-nine dollars and ninety-nine cents, is that disturbing? It's not disturbing because you just have so much more. If you don't have much, everything's a big loss. So if we have this big happiness within us, the little things we deal with, if we only have a little, then any little thing disturbs us so much. And that big happiness is inherent within all of us. And yoga, bhakti yoga, 
teaches us how to transform stress and any other thing that happens into a tool to help us to go deeper and to prosper internally. I'll give an example of how stress can be utilized and managed properly to make us grow. A weightlifter, a weightlifter just weights, and the stress of the weight and Spirituality is the art of transforming what appears to be curse into blessings. Otherwise, we're converting what is actually a blessing into a curse by our attitude, by our perception. In the Bhagavad Gita, this is one of the main themes. It's not about whether you are on this external level, whether you win or lose. Because that all changes. And at the time of death, it really doesn't matter if you won or lost anyway. What really matters is how you connect with the eternal through that situation. Krishna tells Arjuna, in this battle, whether you win or lose is not important. What's important is you try your very best with proper character and integrity to please the Lord in a spirit of compassion. That is the ultimate victory. And that victory is not subjected to the results of the world. This beautiful temple in the Buddha Beach. Panchatattva. In the center is Lord Chaitanya. May Tuki and Tsuki. Not because of her material qualifications, but because of her sincerity, her humility, and her love. Her intent. So right now, he's looking at all of us, and he wants all of us to be Suki. And he's willing to give it from inside out. aspire and make that the priority goal of our life, our internal development, how we can be an instrument of love. A few weeks ago I was in Italy and I visited Assisi, the place of the birth of St. Francis and where he lived for most of his life. And it was interesting because I learned there that St. Francis, he was, you know that prayer, Oh Lord, let me be an instrument of your peace. But he really lived by that principle. And he accessed a, a spiritual power by which he could heal people of disease. when he was 43 years old he got a terrible disease and he was really really in a very very difficult situation and he he got tuberculosis some people said he had a type of cancer also anyways he died when he was 44 years old not a very long life while he was dying in 44, a person came up to him and challenged him. He said, you're, you're healing so many other people of diseases, why don't you heal yourself? You're only 44 years old, you're the head of a big organization. 
There's so much more for you to do in this world. Heal yourself. Come on. Does that make sense? His answer was, he said, I can't heal anybody. And I've never healed anybody. I have no powers to heal. It's God's power. I'm just an instrument of God's power. And if God wants to use me to heal somebody, then he can do it through me too. If God wants to heal me, he can heal me. But I can't do it. And he's not healing me. <laughs> so he welcomed death. <laughs> In the Shumat Bhagavatam, there's a beautiful verse. That a great life is not determined by quantity, but it is determined by quality. Just recently I was in the Muir Woods a few weeks ago, north of San Francisco, where there are big, big redwood trees, sequoia trees. A few years ago I went to King's Canyon, where there's gigantic redwood trees. One was the General Sherman tree, which is the largest tree on the planet Earth. Have any of you seen that? And the divine power that manifested through them and is still manifesting. So yes, life is very precious and every moment is precious. And the real beginning of a of, of, deep spiritual experience comes when we make it a priority to seek what we really want and what we really need in life. And prioritize that in our life and harmonize it accordingly. And it's just sincere. And whatever dukkhi may be in our life becomes sukhi. There's a beautiful saying in the Vedic literatures. Sarve bhavantu sukhiya. Which means, may all beings be happy. Many um, occasions this is chanted. The first time I ever heard it was at a wedding ceremony. And my beloved Guru Dev, Shiva Prabhupada, he began to lecture like this. Sarve Bhavantu Sukhena. He said, May all living beings be happy. And he said, this is the purpose of marriage, to be happy. Now, as a monk, I was hearing a lot of other propaganda. (laughs) (laughs) I was told that the purpose of marriage is to frustrate you so much that you become totally detached from all that stuff, and then you become a monk. So now that you're already a monk, don't don't go through all that stuff just to come back to where you are now. Everybody has their way of explaining things. But then when I go to David say, the purpose of marriage is to become happy. But then he explained to really be happy in marriage or be happy in not marriage and happy in any situation is. Yeah. Bhagavad Gita says intelligence means to be illumined within, rejoice within, and find pleasure within. And to take shelter of the source of all pleasure. What's interesting is this universal spirit. Sarve means everyone. Not just me. 
not just my family, not just my community, or my race, or my national, or my country, men and women, not just people of my religion, or my species. Sarve means let all beings be happy. Arigo. so happy. <laughs> Is that Sophia who said that? Sophia, thank you for making us so happy. That was the best part of the whole lecture. <laughs> <laughs> We're sitting through whatever I said. Just making our natural, spontaneous Because this is love when we're concerned with all beings, because we see the connection that we have with all beings. And that is why in our own bhakti society we follow the principle of vegetarianism, ahimsa. Ahimsa is a very deep subject. Nonviolence means not to cause any unnecessary harm physically, emotionally, or spiritual to any living being. To live by that principle as far as possible. As a matter of ideal and integrity. Because the more we are selfless and the more we are trying to be instruments of God's love, the more every moment of our life has such deep meaning, such deep fulfillment, and the more we can impact the world. And stress and everything else that comes can really help us to access that. Queen of Jewels is the diamond, which has, with the help of nature's wisdom, what is diamond? It's just a piece of ordinary coal that, with that wisdom of nature, under intense pressure, has become a diamond. We have this positive spirit, whatever may come, we can be happy and grow and shine. And in all situations, this simple method of connecting with the divine in whatever may come in life has been given to us to chant this divine mantra. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare. Whether it's a sunny day or a stormy day, if we learn to take shelter of this divine sound of vibration, we find shelter from the stress. And not only that, but it helps us to go deeper into that mantra and grow and grow and grow. Thank you very much.
zero in. And when he gets closer to the expert, he becomes very enthusiastic. <laughs>
scenery you ride in ice, it becomes cold as ice. If you associate with a certain type of people, you develop those qualities. If you associate with saintly people, you will naturally inherit those qualities. If we focus on the faults of others, we bring those faults in ourselves. We become contaminated by those faults. Because that's what we're meditating on. If we meditate and focus on the good qualities of others, then we become enriched by those good qualities, by those good thoughts. It is said that trying to get vengeance on other people is like drinking poison and hoping that it's going to kill the other person. Because just meditating on that is killing your own spiritual nature. So if we know those things, we'll choose to use our intelligence to focus on that which will uplift us rather than degrade us. Does that answer your question? And when we take shelter of the Lord in that situation and try to access grace, that grace can empower us to be able to actually do that. Real, not superficially. And this chanting of God's name is a way to connect with that grace. But we have to have the right intentions for it to do its work properly. This time we will do your time.